everyone, and welcome to our second uh, guest lecture organized by the Open Research Network. So today we are very happy to have Dr. Sharon Black with us, and she's from the University of East Anglia. Um, she will talk to us today about the value and applicability of using qualitative research methods when doing research in media accessibility with participants. So this will be particularly interesting uh, to anyone working with interviews and working with end users. Um, we're very excited to have you and thank you so much for accepting the invitation. And the floor is yours, Sharon. <laughs> thank you very much, Alicia, and thank you to you and the whole of the Open uh, Research Network for inviting me, uh, for having me here today. Um, at uh, yeah, to give to give this talk, I'm really honoured, and I hope you'll find it useful. Um, I am still; it's still very much. It's a, it's a bit of a work in progress. Um, this uh, really, this idea really came out of a comment at a conference from a colleague, um, who sort of commented that um, this was at the um, EST conference in um, Oslo, I'm trying to remember dates and places. And I presented um, some research there, some qualitative research that I'm going to present today. And as part of the really great question and answer session and discussions, um, somebody sort of said, um, well, you know, these are just opinions. They're, they're just opinions. And um, that really, I really, this is one of the reasons why I really enjoy engaging in conversation and debate and discussion at conferences, because that's where sometimes you get challenges or where people really, you know, provoke debate and get you really thinking, you know, of course, my reaction was, well, it's not just opinions, is it? And, uh, but they got me thinking about why, why is it not just opinions? Why is it important? And, and then I started thinking about sort of the uh, prevailing prevailing methods and approaches within our field. It really got me thinking about that and what I think really were it, the directions that we need to develop uh, our research in media accessibility. Um, so I'll talk about the, that today, but I just really wanted to, you know, start with that sort of starting point that was really inspiration for um, for this and made me realize that I needed to, I probably needed to argue for this. I couldn't just take it as a given. Um, so yes, talking about the value and applicability of using qualitative methods in media accessibility research with participants. Um, so I'm hoping my arrows are going to work, yes. So um, a little bit of background, um, you know, as I'm sure you all know, um, media accessibility studies really began um, as part of um, audiovisual translation uh, as, as as a subfield of translation studies. It was really, I suppose, academically, it was really born as a, an area of AVT. And AVT scholars did embrace accessibility as part of their research field. But in recent years, media accessibility has really grown, it's steadily grown to become an independent field in its own right. Um, according to Greco and Jankowska, and I'd very much agree with this. Um, generally, I've noticed that AVT and MA are presented alongside each other. So they sit alongside each other in many headings and many in many academic texts, AVT and MA. And but MA is also growing into an area of accessibility studies, as Greco and Jankowska have pointed out, and it's really um, becoming a driver for major social change you know, as, as an independent field in its own right. Um, you know, and uh, it's really, um, but that's talking, that's talking about today, you know, coming up to today, but in fact, audiences have always been pivotal, pivotal. They've always been key and essential in research um, on translation studies and uh, right up to today, talking about uh, media accessibility today. And so, therefore, along with this rise in, in media accessibility research, there's also this um, 
this increase, this burgeoning reception re research, both within audiovisual translation and media accessibility, as noted uh, by Di Giovanni and Gambier and uh, Anna Jankowska, for example. Um, however, I would argue that um, thus far, uh, reception studies in media in media accessibility um, have and and in AVT research have focused mostly on um, collecting quantitative data and uh, employing cognitive experimental approaches, conducting psycholinguistic research. Um, this is I'm also involved in this kind of research, so I I promise I'm not biased. <laughs> <laughs> but I've not noted that, you know, there's been a real focus, I think, uh, on these approaches, on quantitative approaches, using a battery of questionnaires, tests, you know, comprehension tests, for example, many other kinds of tests, um, electrodermal activity, eye tracking research, uh, measuring heart rate, for example. And I have listed a few studies within, you know, of this type within uh, media accessibility, but certainly there are other studies. This is just to, to mention a few. And certainly um, some of these studies do employ qualitative methods as well, you know, um, for example, interviews and focus groups. But these are, these tend to be secondary, uh, very much secondary and, you know, complementary but also not really focusing on the methods, the, the methodology, the qualitative methodology and approach uh, used that tends to be sort of tagged on um, at the end. Um, yeah, these, these studies are extremely valuable, of course. You know, they test, for example, users' reactions to different linguistic and technical criteria, um, investigating cognitive processes behind um, uh, you know, the reception of, of uh, media accessibility services. Um, certainly valuable insights have been gained and are being gained and, and will continue to be gained. However, I would argue that there's very much a need to employ more qualitative approaches uh, in media accessibility research to, um, to gain more in-depth understandings, a richer picture of users' views and experiences as well. So actually, I've sort of begun to answer that question already. Yes, why is there a need to employ more qualitative um, approaches? Well, um, so to talk, I think I should talk a little bit about what qualitative research is and what is what is its value in general, but also focusing, I mean, there are many um, forms of qualitative research, you know, um, conduct such as focusing on texts, uh, case studies, um, but here, as you'll have noticed from the title, I'm focusing on qual um, qualitative research with participants, and in particular, um, what we have been calling reception research, um, but, I'm sure, maybe you've thought about this too, but reception is quite a passive uh, concept. Uh, I would argue it's a passive activity, but more about that in just a moment. Um, so, well, qualitative research involves collecting and analyzing non-numerical data. As I've mentioned, it could be from text, using video, audio, for example, to understand people's views, perspectives, experiences, and qualitative research really has a rich tradition in the study of human social behaviour. Um, since the late 19th century, researchers have been involved in studying um, social behaviour and the uh, cultures of humankind. And even since the, 19th, the late 19th century, researchers have really perceived the limitations um, in using, in, in quantification, in, in uh, in terms of um, explaining the human uh, phenomena and behavior that they have encountered. Uh, so really um, academic, all academic disciplines concerned with human and social behavior, such as sociology, psychology, anthropology, really do make extensive use of qualitative research methods. 
Qualitative research methods really enable us to, um, to understand how people experience the world and can be used to, um, to gather in-depth insights into a problem or to generate new ideas for research, among other things. So what are um, the traditional qualitative methods? I'm not here to sort of give, teach you, you know, give you, I could talk for an hour and many more hours about qualitative methods and so on, but just to refresh our memories, what are the traditional qualitative methods? So they are observations, which uh, involves recording what you've seen, heard or encountered using detailed field notes. And that involves spending time, spending quite a bit of time with the research participants that you're interested in observing, gaining experience of really spending time with them, building up that rich experience as a researcher and knowledge um, and insight. Uh, also interviews. Um, which can be semi-structured, unstructured, uh, or structured, which uh, involves asking people questions. It says one-on-one -on -one conversations here. I mean, generally, yes, interviews are one-on-one. -on -one. I would argue also, for example, I've conducted uh, interviews with children, and I decided to conduct those interviews with pairs um, because I felt that it would be maybe less daunting for the children being interviewed. Um, but also easier for me to control in pairs rather than in larger groups um, of kids all maybe interacting with each other. So um, that's just an example how, for example, it might just be not always be one on one. Uh, also, focus groups, you can conduct focus groups um, with your, as the name suggests, with your participants in groups. And that really helps generate discussions. That, that can be really fruitful in terms of generating discussions among your participants. Um, and surveys, yes, surveys are kind of a hybrid form of data collection, aren't they? So because questionnaires, I would say, are mainly predominantly quantitative. However, you can also have open-ended questions in your surveys, which can be a really effective way of collecting qualitative data. But I would argue, you know, it's tempting to pick the methods that you're familiar with. And perhaps there's been a tendency uh, for those of us embarking on some qualitative research to stick to those um, traditional methods. But why not, um, why not think about more creative research methods? N not just, I mean, we'll talk about the benefits in just a moment, but really, the point I wanted to emphasize here is that sometimes those traditional methods are not adequate and maybe they're not enough to fully address your research topic, the comp complex kinds of research topics that you um, that you might want to address. You know, if you so these methods can be useful for, as I've said, addressing complex research questions, particularly in relation to new trends or aspects of social life. Does that sound familiar to you, maybe as media accessibility researchers? Uh, complex research, new trends, new aspects of social life, uh, where traditional methods may not be sufficient to answer those questions. These methods can also be useful if your research is focused on problem solving, um, which may also resonate with you. Uh, if your topic is new or emerging, we certainly have plenty of new and emerging areas within media accessibility. Um, or if your research project has a specific aim in challenging, changing, or responding to dominant assumptions in society. Again, I feel this, you know, may resonate with you as uh, you know, scholars with an interest in media accessibility. So, the methods I've got here um, on the slide are, first of all, arts-based research. Um, so briefly, arts-based research can focus on, it focuses on using artistic processes in various forms, um, written, visual, spoken, performance, um, you know, using video, film, filmmaking, dance, uh, you know, various creation of artistic forms as a main way of understanding and exploring experiences of a topic 
both by the researcher and the participants. So these, these methods can be really effective in exploring people's experiences, sensitive topics, um, exploring feelings and emotions, uh, people who speak different languages, again, very relevant, and people with communication difficulties, for example. So I think very, very relevant to, to us. Um, research using technology. And what I mean here is um, interacting with your participants via online communities or studying your participants via online communities using, for example, digital tools to create things. Blog posts could be through social media, um, virtual interviews and focus groups, which I think uh, some of us ex have experienced during the pandemic and have become more experienced in, um, in running these types of sessions. Transformative research can be very useful for uh, if you're aiming to challenge or change what might be seen as a dominant position or a status quo in society to challenge or change part of your participants' lives. Um, you know, some sort of transformation. These uh, transformative research can include participatory research, action research and community-based research, which um, I'll show you some examples today. Um, also mixed methods research. I'm sure many of you, uh, or perhaps all of you are familiar with mixed methods research, but this is really, this idea is a combination it's often thought of as using a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods, such as traditionally the questionnaire and the interview. But there's actually more to this concept and it, it can um, involve combining more than one qualitative method. Uh, I hope I've provided inspiration by mentioning quite a few here, um, you know, in terms of creative methods that can be mixed. And the mixed methods can be useful to consider when you're seeking to explore questions or topics that are too complex for one method alone to address. So talking a little bit more about mixed methods. Um, so in, also in, to, in addition to uh, addressing complex topics, Mixed methods can also be valuable um, in the exploratory stages of a research project. So you can use the research I'm going to present to you today was exploratory in a way. And I found so many, so many different things were brought up by, you know, really valuable and important insights from um, participants that could all go on to be their own, you know, could all be further explored. So in the exploratory stages to um, to um, clarify research questions or refine research questions, to assist with conceptualization uh, or to generate a hypothesis. This is in terms of mixed methods. So if you're thinking of going on, say, to an experimental study. Um, it can also help talking about experimental research. The equalitative methodologies can also help with identifying the correct variables. You know, it, it sometimes, if there's not much existing research in your area, it, it um it's often worth thinking about whether you are actually identifying the correct variables to be measured. Um, maybe qualitative exploratory research would be useful first, because you might find that you're not targeting the most appropriate factors. Um, if you don't do that, qualitative work can also be valuable for um interpreting, qualifying, or illuminating uh, quantitative research findings. Um, so yeah, it can be complementary or it can contradict. You also might find there are areas where your qualitative data contradicts your quantitative findings. Also for triangulation and supporting the validation process. So for example, where three or more methods are used, and the results are compared for similarity. So lots of different uses there if you're thinking of doing or you're currently um, embarking on mixed methods research. 
Therefore, so what I've said so far, I, I, I would um, assert at this point that qualitative methods can be more effective than quantitative approaches in explaining complex phenomena. I think I have um, already mentioned this 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 idea of the complexity and highlighted the, the you know complexity and as such qualitative methods are valuable additions to our method methodological armory they're not just something we can tag on at the end um as a complement without really putting too much thought into the methodology but really they are um valuable additions to our methodology so um but you know, methods are not always, you know, it's important to, to, to select the best uh, methods for your research questions and not just use a method for the sake of it. So what research questions are best answered using a qualitative approach? So um, it's important to remember that um, first and foremost, unlike quantitative research, inquiry conducted in the qualitative tradition seeks to answer the question, what, as opposed to the question, how often. So qualitative methods are designed to reveal what is going on by describing and interpreting phenomena as well, as it says here. They don't attempt to measure how often, um, how often something happens, but rather um, it's all about describing and interpreting phenomena. And um, research conducted using qualitative methods is normally done with an intent to preserve the inherent complexities in human behavior, as opposed to assuming uh, a reductive view of the, um, you know, of the of the topic, uh, in order to count or measure the occurrence of phenomena. So it's really about uh, preserving the preserving the inherent complexities rather than reducing um, or, or taking a, a reductive approach. So that means that there's not always easy answers. Um, the, the you know uh, the an experience I faced at, at when I presented my qualitative research uh, um, at EST. A consequence of this was that I wasn't able to present. Um, the audience with easy takeaways, with easy answers, in terms of what uh, you know, in terms of what uh, the, you know, the voices of the users and the experiences that they'd had, and that's maybe not something that uh, audiences are always always um, accustomed to, to to being faced with in terms of their thoughts, you know. Um, but we'll talk talk more about that in, in a moment. But yes. It's very different in a way than presenting, um, you know, key quantitative findings, really, uh, in that sense. Qualitative research normally takes an inductive approach. So um, often moving from observation to hypothesis rather than hypothesis testing or deduction. So often uh, at the moment I am deep in analysis of my qualitative uh, data and I'm, I've started there really. And then I'm going to, you know, from there, go to the research and compare compare the, what I find from my data with the research, you know, rather than um, the other way around saying an eye tracking study, I would start with the, res the existing research and work from there taking a deductive approach. So it's, it's a very different approach. Um, why am I arguing then for, um, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, I think there's maybe a, do I have, yeah, I have, uh, I have, um, sorry, I've altered the order of my slides. Um, so yeah, I what I'd wanted to add here were some, I wanted to counter some of the misconceptions about qualitative research. So I've mentioned at the beginning that um, a comment I, I encountered at a conference was, well, it's just opinions, it's simply just opinions. And um, other conceptions are that uh, qualitative research is of little value. This is obviously not my view, but uh, this is um, an existing view. 
that uh, there's little value in qualitative research because we cannot generalize from them. So in case you're not aware, generalization refers to the extent that findings can be applied to other people uh, uh, or other times or settings than the, so other people to the population more generally, rather than just the, um, the people in taking part in the study. And, and a common criticism of qualitative research is that the results of a study are rarely, if ever, generalizable to a larger population because the sample groups are small in qualitative research and they're not chosen randomly. However, I would argue that such, you know, these criticisms fail to recognize the distinctive of qualitative research. Um, so whereas in quantitative research, the intent is to secure a large random sample that is representative of, representative of the general population, um, you know, focusing on generalizations and thereby allowing for statistical inference of results that aim to be applicable across the entire an entire population. On the other hand, in qualitative research, generalizab generalizability is um, based on the assumption that it's valuable to begin to understand similar situations or people. So understanding people that are similar in one way, that have shared characteristics, they possess relative char relevant characteristics for the question being considered. So um, qualitative researchers often use what, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, but purposive sampling. Uh, so I know I'm sort of, you know, presenting a lot of concepts here, but it's really um, just an overview. You know, I'm happy to talk more um, at the end of the talk, you know, discuss these concepts more if you'd like and, and tell you more. But purposive sampling is uh, where uh, participants are selected deliberate, deliberately to test a particular um, question. So it's not about identifying a random group, but really um, group a group that possess relevant characteristics, as it says here, relevant to the question. Um, so the idea is to, to have a, a rich interpretation then that deepens our understanding. It's um, about richness and in-depth understandings uh, of uh, phenomena within that group that's been selected um, to, as a result of their re relevant characteristics for the question. Another um, common misconception is that um, qualitative research um, cannot really claim reliability or validity. So briefly, in quantitative research, reliability is the extent to which different observers um, can make the same observations or collect the same data about the object of study. Um, so, but in, um, in qualitative research, we have this concept, I don't know if you've heard of it before, but it's concept of uh, trustworthiness. And trust, one way to demonstrate trustworthiness in qualitative research is to present detailed evidence in the form of quotations from interviews and field notes along with uh, thick textual descriptions um, of episodes, events, settings in, in observational research, for example. Um, to be trustworthy, qualitative um, analysis should also be auditable, making it uh, possible to retrace the steps um, that leading to a certain interpretation or a certain theory to check that no alternatives were left un unexamined and that no research or biases um, had any avoidable influence on the results. In terms of validity, um, in in the sciences, in the natural sciences or in and in experimental studies, findings are validated by replication. And if a second investigator cannot replicate the findings, um, then it's found that you know the, the original results are rejected as flawed and invalid. So um, that's uh, validity, very briefly. Um, 
However, in you know, using qualitative research, for example, val uh, triangulation can be used, um, combining multiple views, approaches, and methods to obtain a more accurate interpretation of the phenomena, thereby creating an analysis of greater depth, of greater richness. So um, this is really um, a way in which I could go more in, in, in depth, you know, into more depth on this, but that's really um, a way that we can increase um, validity and in qualitative research. So that's just, I've talked about um, qualitative research in general really there. Um, and maybe you, I hope that as I was uh, presenting those points that you felt that you could relate them to media accessibility, you know, and perhaps to your own research interests. But um, looking more specifically at uh, media accessibility research, um, why am I arguing, as it asks here, that more qualitative research is needed in uh, media accessibility? So, well, uh, one of the reasons is that what we're what we're seeing now in media accessibility research, we're seeing a, we've seen a change, um, you know, over time in recent years. Um, so until recently, audiovisual uh, translation uh, studies and media accessibility studies focused on modes of consumption, uh, on uh, audiences passively consuming audiovisual content. That's uh, been made accessible. Um, but really, in recent years, um, changes in modes of consumption and technology um, in, in recent years, well, it says slightly more than a decade, but I think it's probably um, longer now, you know, times move quickly, but approximately, there's been an, unfo an unforeseen surge in agency, uh, interactivity on the part of audiences, as Di Giovanni and Gambier have pointed out. Um, and yeah, so there's more agency and creativity and personalization in the hands of users, as it says in the in the title here. Today, media content can be sh created, shared, uh, modified, and customized by by users. Therefore, the empowerment of end users has really, um, as Di Giovanni and Gambia have said shaken and stirred the very notion of audience, of what an audience is. Uh, increasing the, you know, there's now an increasing difficulty in marking any boundary really between um, media and the producers and consumers uh, of translated and accessible uh, media. Um, some, there are different terms used to, to talk about this, such as prosumers, um, producers, I think uh, Elena de Giovanni used and uh, mentioned in 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 her work on this. Uh, Gian Maria Greco talks about the po the poetic. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. I pr pronounce it as poetic, but I think it's poetic, poet, poetic. I think I need Gian Maria to confirm that for me. But we can see it here on the slide. Uh, um, so the poetic. Uh, model of agency. Uh, even though my pronunciation isn't great, I'm certainly really interested in this this concept, this model, um, because Jan Maria has explained that this is the model whereby all stakeholders, including users, have a voice and are fully participating, active agents and co-creators in in media accessibility process processes. There's also, uh, we're also experiencing greater personalization, aren't we? You know, greater personalization in um, media, uh, media products that uh, that we that we interact with, that we use, and with all of this comes increasing complexity. You know, again, this word complexity comes up. So we uh, we are no longer passive audiences, but rather active users uh, of digital content and products that, and we may, you know, users who make informed decisions 
uh, you know, who should be able to make informed decisions about how they interact with and, you know, interact with accessibility services and with accessible media um, content to really benefit fully from 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 that from those experiences and those interactions. Also, qualitative research can help to give voice to marginalized people, to marginalized groups. And um, so, yeah, um, you may be familiar with some of the concepts presented here on the slide um, that uh, really provide a theoretical framework. Um, so, uh, you know, that's relevant to, to, to us, um, uh, you know, uh, with those of us who have an interest in media accessibility research with participants. So, for example, the social model of disability, um, according which according to the social model of disability, I'm sure you're, many of you will be familiar with this model, but briefly, um, uh, according to the social model of disability, disability is understood as a form of social inclusion, sorry, exclusion. I'm so used to talking about inclusion, but we also have to talk about exclusion. It's important to do so. So disability understood as a form of social exclusion imposed on disabled people by a society which oppresses and disables them. Um, and this, uh, this um, it comes from the um, article by Tom Shakespeare, The Social Model of Disability, and also The Fundamental Principles of Disability. Um, and this model, the social model of disability, is linked to what Gian Maria Greco calls the social model of accessibility in his article, Towards a Pedagogy of Accessibility, published in 2019. And so this, so this, this involves the right to active participation. Um, you know, it's the right to active participation is really embedded in the social model of accessibility, with all stakeholders having a voice and a role in the co-construction of solutions to access problems. Um, also, social justice, the concept of social justice is really central to media accessibility due to its demand for a fairer and more equitable world with respect to how wealth opportunities and privileges, including knowledge, are distributed within society. Um, and this, this quote comes from um, a PhD, uh, PhD thesis by Zoe Moores uh, on training professional re-speakers to subtitle live events in the UK, a participative model for access and inclusion. So when users are not uh, able to make full use of media content due in part to a lack of uh, accessibility services, this is an example of social, uh, of social injustice. The social model of accessibility um, that I've just presented in the previous slide is also reflective of the three shifts of John Maria Greco's three shifts, um, which I am sure many of you are uh, are familiar with. So um, I'll not go too into depth on those. I'm happy to uh, expand further to discuss further at the end of the talk. But briefly, um, Greco's uh, three shifts that he has identified. Um, uh, occurring in the various research areas focusing, focusing on accessibility are number one, from per particularist accounts to a universalist account of access. Number two, from maker-centered to user-centered approaches. And three, from reactive to proactive approaches. I'm also aware, I think Jan Maria actually also gave a talk for this network, which um, I watched the recording and I think he, he talks about uh, the, the three shifts um, possibly in, in his talk. But I wanted to focus today on the second shift um, because um, the second shift relates to the evolution and understanding that users are bearers of valuable knowledge for the investigation of accessibility processes and phenomena. Um, and these, uh, if you want to know, if you want to read more, these uh, 
this information comes from Greco's 2018 article, The Nature of Accessibility Studies. So given that according to Greco's second shift, users are bearers of valuable knowledge for the investigation of accessibility processes and phenomena, um, then they are experts in their experiences. And um, research approaches should take this into account that users are experts on, on their experiences um, and that they can they contribute valuable knowledge, uh, not just opinions, um, but yes, valuable knowledge on uh, on media accessibility. I'm not the only, I'm aware I'm not the only uh, researcher in media accessibility who has called for um, more you know, qualitative uh, research in media accessibility. Uh, Pablo Romero Fresco has also called for more qualitative research. Um, uh, and as he says, placing the focus back on the individual. Um, also Romero Fresco's uh, work using an engagement-based approach uh, which takes the user as a reference. Um, quoting Romero Fresco there. Uh, also, Romero Fresco and Dangerfield in their work uh, on accessibility as a conversation um, have uh, made a proposal for uh, creative media access or for alternative uh, media access. To give you a few examples, I'll give you a few examples of. Um, uh, but these are not by no means the only researchers who have been conducting research using qualitative approaches. But some recent examples uh, are uh, Kate Dangerfield's um, um, uh, essay film that uh, she presented at Media for All on access as a conversation and participatory approaches in media accessibility. Another notable example is I just quoted Zoe Murr's PhD thesis. Um, Murr's used uh, action research and action research methodology, and that really facilitated close collaboration with users and providers in uh, Murr's research. Um, uh, they used focus groups, observations, and um, uh, you know to really gain in-depth understandings. Um, of the you know of the views of uh, different groups, including deaf, deaf and hard of hearing people, and non-native speakers of English and re-speakers. Also, recent work presented at the EST conference by Nina Riviers and Sabia Anour. I know you. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, a touch of museum to scale: the collaborative development of accessible art experiences. So this work is in collaboration with a variety of stakeholders, again, art experts, researchers, access providers. Um, you know, the number one aim of this research, uh, as they have they stated, was to involve users with varying abilities in access creation and in academic exploration. So here we can see that, you know, bringing, bringing, uh, bringing users together with, you know, other stakeholders, and in you know the complexity uh, of these of these projects. So I'm aware of time, uh, and I'm really glad I focused on on these different aspects um, because I don't want to focus too much on my own research. But I'll just uh, being aware of time, I'll give you a whistle stop tour uh, of a recent study that I conducted. I've conducted that I'm still it's still a work in progress in terms of writing up the research, and I presented this at the EST conference. So. Um, yeah, uh, but in case you ha didn't have the opportunity to attend. Um, so this research uh, is, um, the presentation is, was entitled A Difficult Art Getting It Right, a Thematic Analysis of Users' Views and Experiences of Audio Description in the UK. Um, this research was conducted with 14 participants aged 21 to 60 years with a range of different disabilities. Uh, nine of the participants were blind or partially sighted, but there were also participants um, uh, who are with a range of different disabilities, um, uh, including um, dyslexia and cognitive disabilities. Um, as as I've already already discussed, 
I, I was, you know, a really a real key concept in this research was um, viewing users as bearers of va valuable knowledge. And the, the so I conducted interview research, and this was uh, during the pandemic. So it was by telephone or Zoom. And the, the interviews really ranged in duration from between 30 minutes to two hours. So some really in-depth conversations taking place. And um, so I used uh, thematic analysis to identify themes across the data set. Um, so thematic analysis, as it says here, uh, it involves developing themes or patterns of meaning across a data set that addresses a research question. And I'm um, sorry, I'm just going back for a second because really going back to my research question at the moment, it's, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's very exploratory and open. I really um, was looking at users' views and experiences of, of audio description. This is the element of the research that um, it was ready ready enough to present. It's ready enough to present to you, to you now, but it's still a work in progress. And I identified six themes um, from the, the data, from the interview data. So the themes were better provision for contemporary media access, more diversity and representation in audio description, audio description tailored to young adult audiences, sharing audio described viewing experiences with family and friends, provision of more min subtle minimalistic AD, these are the words, these are the voices of the participants themselves and integrating audio description into the filmmaking process. So from, from what the participants told me, these were the six themes that I identified uh, in terms of what they were highlighting, uh, of, in terms of what was important to them. So in terms of better provision um, for contemporary media access, this theme, um, participants, um, expressed that the existing provision was very much appreciated, but that there was a clear need to improve access, particularly access to older classic shows, live programming, websites, social media, for example, video on demand. Um, interviewees highlighted a lack of audio description, for example, on graphs and the news during the pandemic, you know, which is really key information for, for, for uh, citizens. And uh, interviewees also highlighted that it wasn't always clear that audio description is even, it's not always clear that it's even available or easy to turn on. Uh, Hadia, which is a pseudonym for uh, a 22 year old university graduate taking part in the study said, I think it adds to my experience, whereas other people might not feel that way, but I like learning about the race of characters on TV. So that links to um, that actually links to the theme on diversity. Um, Hadia talked about um, diversity, and uh, you know that, that that it's important to her, um, and she likes learning about the race of characters on TV. Um, interviews like Hadia also um, highlighted um, the importance of tailoring uh, audio description to young audiences. And the importance of young young adult audio, young adult voices doing audio description. Hadia says, when I watch young a young adult program, they have a voice um, which is more suited to that type of content, which is quite nice. Uh, I think Hadia is talking about Netflix here, and and she highlighted she really appreciated that there was a voice more suited to to that type of content for young audiences, and felt that there was real thought going into it. Um, William, a pseudonym again for um, a 30 year old interviewee who works for a sight loss charity, said, no matter how sensitive, um, it still takes an element away from that moment in the horror movie. Uh, oh, this is again um, talking about audio description and how he, he would prefer the audio description to be more subtle or minimalistic. Um, uh, so, yes, he says, no matter how sensitive, it still takes an element away from that moment in the horror movie or that you have to dim the sound of the explosions and the action to be able to describe what's going on. 
Pradia also talks about romantic. So this is to do with the subtle, the idea of the subtle minimalistic audio description. Pradia says, I find it funny to have this juxtaposition of this crazy thing happening on screen and a really bored voice. I think the same thing with romantic stuff always makes me laugh. It makes people awkward to hear audio description that is disinterested on what's happening on the screen. I could talk more about this, but I'm aware of time. Um, so, yeah, William says it can really grate on me sometimes when there's too much audio description. You want it to be really subtle. I think it's a difficult art getting it right. When I've watched a film that does get it right, it feels fantastic. You just get really immersed in the moment. Um, Martina um, is an interviewee. Um, he was aged 51 at the time of the interview and works for a communications regula regulator. And in relation, this quote is in relation to the theme of family, sharing experiences with family. Martina says, if we had an accessible app and you can access the soundtrack with audio description in the app, in the app you can watch with family, with your family. Martina really felt that her family didn't wouldn't want to hear the audio description, which maybe is goes in, against what we as researchers might think um, and proposes would like an accessible app that would allow her to to access the AD separately, but also watching with the family. Um, William uh, says um, he actually, you know, interviews actually identified um, really identified uh, this concept that we as researchers are familiar with, that of integrating the audio description uh, into the process, into the creation of the, the, the media, the product, the film or the TV program. Uh, this was identified by, by, by the interviewees. For example, William says, if the audio description could have some input from the artistic creators of the film, it gives us much more of a similar experience to everyone else. So just to sum up, um, I've covered the themes just in a very general way here. It's a very much a, a, a whistle top, um, a, a whistle stop tour, and yeah. So just very briefly to say that it was a small sample size in this study. However, um, it did it really did enable me to gain a rich pic picture of users' views and experiences gained through those in depth discussions. And as I'd said earlier, there were many insight insights gained. Um, on areas for a very for very necessary future research, um, qualitative research. So thank you very much. Um, I'm aware I've talked for a long time, so I hope that there's still I can certainly stick around for questions, and I hope others can. And yeah, I certainly welcome any questions. Thank you, Sharon. Um, no, don't apologize. I think you made a very solid case for qualitative uh, research. Uh, we actually have two questions in the chat already, so I suggest that we start with those and then anybody else can just like raise their hand. Um, so we have a question from Kat that says, is universal design included in or linked with the social model of accessibility? Yes, great question. And um, yes, this is a really important question as well. And um, I was actually writing about this recently in an article related to I was writing about the social model of accessibility. Um, would you mind if I go back to, well, maybe it's too much hassle to go back to the slide. Um, no, let me just let me just try and um, so that yes, the social the this the concept of universal design um, is important, isn't it? It's it's key because um, it's that idea that we're, we uh, rather than focusing on small subsets of people and and users, um, in terms of um, say if we're designing training and and research, um, that that really it it involves everyone. Accessibility is for all users. But how does that work? How does that work? Um, in terms of the social model access of accessibility. Well, simply, um, well, sim simply, not simply, but it's it's important. We can't. Um, um, it's a difficult one. So we are including everyone in the, our concept of a universal design. However, at the same time, it's important to remember that um, 
people have different face different challenges, have different experiences, different needs and requirements, you know, as we as we already know. And we cannot ignore we cannot ignore that uh, or brush over uh, the uh, uh, the issues of social justice and the, the social model of disability. So I feel, you know, in my work, I have I find that they are complement that they work together they've worked together for me so far you know so for example in the article I was the research I've been writing up uh, so it was designed with the universal design concept uh, at its core and and it meant that we were able to bring together users with many different users with different disabilities uh, and different experiences who really found value actually in um, in talking to each other and learning from each other, you know, and so my research still, you know, acknowledged, very much acknowledged the uh, social model of disability and the importance of that, you know, at the same time. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, so I see there's another question in the chat. Oh, yes. Well, that's yes, that's a quite a difficult question. So what if the findings based on qualitative methods contradict the quantitative methods? Yeah, that's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I there's no. Answer answer sorry, just to, um, I think there's a follow up question from Kat. Also, ah, Kat, you thank you. Yourself if you want to join the conversation. Like, thank you. She just said which groups were involved. OK, so. Which groups were involved in my research? Yeah, Kat, please. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the yes. groups like, um, was it only people who experienced some sort of um, visual issues or auditor auditory or issues um, or were like people with autism or different forms of physical um, disabilities or devel developmental disabilities involved? Yes, all of those. All, all of those, all of those that you pointed out. So um, yes, we, we um, in this in, in this research, um, the research brought together, what we did was we created training um, on uh, as part of the research on using digital accessibility tools and uh, focusing on training as well. Uh, so tools and training and the research brought together um, a group of people who participated in the training and who also some of whom participated in the interviews and we also had other participants um, you know additional participants uh, taking part in the interviews and yes in the we had partic a group participants with um, several participants with autism um, dyslexia um, and participants who um, were deaf and hard of hearing, blind and partially sighted, and um, also participants with physical disabilities and uh, other, um, um, I'm trying to remember, there was, uh, it's, as, as I don't have it on a slide <laughs> from memory, but yes, essentially participants with uh, mul uh, multiple uh, disabilities and a range of different disabilities who worked together in the training and reported that they really, you know, s seemed to overall really, you know, enjoyed that experience. And it also was reflected in the re the research um, here. I mean, today, today in this, the, the, the findings that I've, um, that I've presented today, and the quotes are from participants who are users of audio description and who are all um, blind or partially sighted. However, the broader research involved um, participants with different different disabilities. Apart, apologies if that wasn't particularly clear. I think I was probably rushing at the end when I was no, uh, no problem. presenting my particular project. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, um, it sounds like really interesting that so many different uh, categories of people were included uh, to get this overall picture of, you know, what what their needs are, for, like from their standpoint. Um, so yes, thank you for uh, for the answer. And yeah, it was it was um, 
very clear. Thank you. I'm really glad it was clear. I'm glad it was clear, and I'm I'm really glad that um, uh, you found it interesting. I'm happy to carry on discussions. Um, you know, I'm happy. I'm sure Alicia can um pass on my contact details and so on. So feel free to get in touch. Um, you know, um, if you want to carry on the discussion or have any questions. I think Sharon, if we still have time, could we just go back to the question by Eva because uh, mm -hmm. it looks quite interesting. Yeah, so she asked no, in the chat. I'll send an email um asking for contact details and maybe sources. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, please do, please do. Thanks. Okay, so the question is, uh, what if some findings based on qualitative methods contradict those based on quantitative methods? Which should be considered more significant and which should we try to do more research on? Sure, I mean, that's a really interesting question, as you say. So yeah, thanks for that question. I think it really depends on your research project. So it depends on your findings and your methods and your um, your interests, your aims as a researcher, really. <laughs> Sorry, I can't be more specific, but it is it is a very general question, so it really would depend. But it's I'd say it's important not to be worried or concerned. It's not a bad thing, that, you know. Um, if your your findings contradict each other, this is part of you know research is messy and should be messy. I mean, of course, it's nice if everything is consistent. But one of the things this sort of puts me in mind of that sort of contradiction and messiness. I think that's one of the things that really we were discussing when I presented my research at EST was that um, it's messy and contradictory. And so what do we do? What do we take away? What do we do now, basically? And I think that's one of the challenges of, of qualitative, you know, doing qualitative research with participants um, and learning more about their views and experiences is that it's complex and nuanced and can be contradictory. Um, you know, but it's also, um, you know, rich and detailed. It really enhances our understanding. And uh, I think we have, um, I think we really need, uh, an, as part of maturing as a field to conduct more qualitative research, to learn more about um, our, you know, about users' views and experiences and perspectives. But I wouldn't, yeah. Um, it really, coming back to the question, it really depends. Um, but I wouldn't be afraid to um, to conduct, to feel, I think there's a feeling that within the field, maybe there's been a sense that um, quantitative methods are more rigorous or more valid. Um, as I'm using a fancy machine, and, and I actually do that, I mean, in my eye tracking research, I think we we really shouldn't um forget about the value of of qualitative research, as Kat says in the um in the comments. It shows the complexity of humanity. It certainly does. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Grace, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> I have to use a lot of qualitative methods in my in my project. So yeah. Okay, um, then are there any other final questions before we finish? Uh, yeah, Sarah. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> um, Hi, Sarah. Hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was very happy um, to hear that you were talking about qualitative methods um, because I used a lot of that in my own research. So that was really nice to see it getting um, the attention that it deserves. Um, my question is about, you mentioned trustworthiness in terms of um, providing all the data or like the transcripts of your interviews and focus groups um, to, I suppose, prove that you're, you're not being, you, you're not being too biased, but at the same time, should we not as researchers, because we're doing positive research, should we not also um be really upfront and acknowledge our own biases which come from our own experiences so for example like me um you know i'm a like 30 year old white woman um who's not blind so that's obviously going to influence then how i um conduct my research so do you think that we should as researchers be more upfront about our own biases when we do qualitative research 
Yes, um, I fully agree with you. Um, I was trying to go through my slides and find the relevant slide, but then I don't want to take time away. Um, but yes, this concept of trustworthiness. Um, uh, is it here? No, um, or somewhere here? I think it is. Anyway, yes, there it is. There it is. So, um, yes. Yeah, so this. This this idea of trans, trustworthiness, I think I, I fully agree with you. I sometimes when I some of the sources that I've been I've read uh, about qualitative research tend to emphasize objectivity and view the researcher as an objective uh, tool, nearly in a way, you know, a tool that con for conducting the research, you know, and yeah. That, the data um, reveals itself and the findings reveal themselves to the to the researcher without the researcher actually doing anything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the researcher is completely is, is just a tool by which the truth is revealed. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that is. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. I think that we should acknowledge our own uh, uh, biases and I think it's important to do so. I think that talking about you know, discussing trustworthiness, I think it has more to do with quality and rigor in research and transparency. You know, I think it's important to be rigorous and transparent um, and to follow sound ethical uh, procedures in research. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is good research practice, really. Yeah. And this is and if we demonstrate that we are ethical, uh, uh, rigorous researchers that follow sound um, procedures, then um, hopefully uh, people reading our research will will trust will trust that will trust us and see that our research is trustworthy. Um, however, at the same time, yes, I think it is important to and to not shy away from recognizing the the biases that we all have. I think that's part of a mature uh, approach, you know, developed approach to qualitative research. And we shouldn't be afraid because, again, that's one of those claims that's made against qualitative research. It's biased as if that were a bad thing, as if that were a reason to discount qualitative methods. Um, but yes, uh, rigor and um, and trust this, this idea of, of, of trans, trans, trustworthiness, I, I feel, is, is important. And um, yeah, anyway, I hope that makes sense. For sure. No, <laughs> I agree. I agree. Thank you. No problem. Okay, I think uh, just on a similar note, Kat just added that should we reveal any disabilities we might have to include to increase trustworthiness. Wow, what a question! Yes, I think you know that's such an interesting question. I think, of course, that's up to the researcher. Um, of course, that's the researcher's decision as to whether they wish to do that. Um, but I certainly think that um, you know, that could be hugely valuable, hugely valuable for a research project. Um, you know, and that's a really um a really um a good example of how of what a researcher can bring to the research. You know, we're talking about objectivity and um the researcher being completely objective and so on, but actually what value, you know, the huge value that a researcher can bring um to, to the research in terms of their own experiences, their own lived experiences. And, um, you know, so certainly that can be of huge value. And I think there, you know, there are methods, there's qualitative methods that you can use to, um, it's not my area of expertise, but I can certainly uh, look into it. Methods that involve very much, uh, you know, the researchers views and experiences involved in, in the research as well. So yeah, certainly. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you for being with us. Um, and yeah, I think I'm afraid we might have to finish there. Yeah, um, thank you for thanks again for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. And uh, bye, everyone. See you next month for our uh, research seminar. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.